Greetings, everyone, and welcome to uh, week seven uh, in this uh, course on Christian cultural heritage. We are approaching the end of uh, this uh, eight week course, and uh, we've covered a lot of territory already. This uh, last uh, series of lectures, there's uh, two uh, uh, from myself, but you'll have some lectures from uh, online sources as well. Uh, but this one, we are going to talk about uh, Christian engagement uh, of the secular world and our pluralistic uh, world that we live in. And so uh, week seven and eight, we'll have lectures on that. And you'll have guest lectures from some YouTube uh, videos done by uh, experts in this field as well. And you'll be expected, like you do with my lectures, take notes on those and submit them as uh, part of your assignment. So keep that in mind as we go forward here. And so let me uh, share the screen with you and uh, we will get started on uh, this next lecture here. Christian engagement of modern secularism and pluralism. And as we get into this, we will be uh, talking about uh, how Christianity can make a difference in our uh, modern world where we're having the influence of secularism more and more and then pluralism uh, more and more. So there are a lot of things competing for people's attention uh, in the world. How, how can they pick a worldview from which to live? Um, and so they need to be thinking about those things. We as Christians need to be thinking about those because it does impact us. The world we live in does impact us. And so in these video presentations, we'll be talking about how we can engage this uh, society we live in, uh, but also uh, think about our own situation and the things we need to consider as we strive to uh, live a Christian life, or if we're still struggling with what worldview it is that we uh, will follow, uh, this becomes part of uh, the engagement process. So we're going to be talking about that as we uh, go along here. All right, let's just uh, a reminder, uh, all the way back to the very beginning of, of this course, uh, we talked uh, first of all, what is Christian cultural heritage and kind of laid a foundation for what that, that is. And uh, we began seeing uh, the difference between a closed worldview and an open worldview. And of course, uh, a, a secular perspective of the world, uh, the material universe only exists, humanity evolves, solely a product of material forces. Truth is relative on moral issues. Uh, existence by accident, humanity is ultimately the authority, uh, as opposed to an open worldview, which, it, which sees the world as material and spiritual in the universe. Man created in the image of God, truth is revealed by God, creation by intelligent design, and God's the authority. Now, we began with what is Christian cultural heritage and, and introduced this background to a closed versus, versus an open worldview. We talked, uh, in one uh, presentation, we talked about uh, Christianity's global presence in the world and the fact the world is overwhelmingly uh, religious, despite the growth of secularism in our particular case in the U.S. and especially Western Europe. Uh, then we had a whole section on Western thought and religion where we discussed, you know, uh, how people explain away religion as some um, kind of neurosis or psychological feeling. Uh, we talked about the evolutionary approach as well. And then uh, the next one we uh, talked about discerning uh, worldviews in a pluralistic society. And so uh, those uh, all uh, have been things we've talked about. And then last uh, time, uh, we talked, uh, well, two times back, we talked about uh, Christian heritage in the U.S. And we trace uh, how uh, Christianity from the very beginning influenced the world we live in and the Western world and came down through Europe and on into the U.S. and it had a great impact on uh, the system of governance we have today. And of course, Christianity has been a prominent 
uh, aspect of our culture in the U.S. for uh, from the very beginning. And then uh, last uh, lecture, we were talking about the rise of uh, modern secularism and the challenge it brings. So here we move in now to how to the Christian uh, engagement of secularism and our pluralistic society as, as a whole, which we defined in a uh, previous lecture. All right, so uh, what we want to be as Christians is what Christ called us to be as part of our worldview. Uh, we're to enter the communities of life to serve and represent Christ. You can see here two pictures, one here kind of a fortress. This is a uh, kind of a fortress mentality, the idea that we as Christians, uh, we need to be separate from the world and we fortify ourselves in our churches. You know, if people want to come and visit and be a part, that's great, uh, but we want to protect ourselves from the world. That's really not the picture that Jesus left with us. Uh, and he leaves the other side uh, where he said, go into all the world and make disciples. You know, this very diverse, pluralistic, secular, you know, made up of different worldviews, those challenges, just like the early church had, did that. Uh, and he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, Acts 1.8. Uh, so Jesus foresaw that his mission that he was completing was going to be carried on by his followers in church. And, uh, and that's the picture we're left with. And what we strive to do is to realize that we're called to engage the world we live in and enter into the lives of people in their various uh, communities. And we don't want to forget that. But in doing that, it raises challenges. So we have to understand the difference in people's uh, perspectives and worldviews, and, but yet respect them uh, and love them as Jesus did. And so we're going to talk about this engagement uh, as we go along here. Let's remind ourselves about the context of the early Christians. If you uh, read uh, Schmidt's book, um, you got a good feel for how early Christianity uh, was so distinctive and, and uh, gave rise to many things that helped people that came down th from early on into Christianity as it historically grew uh, from uh, its period uh, starting in Jerusalem and then Judea, as it says in scripture, and Samaria, and then uh, all, all of uh, the world. And uh, just a reminder that Christianity came into the Roman Empire, which was very diverse ethnically. They had conquered a lot of people, uh, groups, and uh, cultures, and they, uh, so it was very diverse with lots of gods and goddesses, uh, religiously pluralistic, uh, and with a lot of different philosophies out there. Uh, it came into a world where the moral standards were very low and very relative. Uh, as you read in some of your reading, uh, you know, it was as bad as it is today, if not more so. And certainly they, they had a uh, low view of life, uh, you know, exposing children, uh, infanticide, uh, abortion was very common. How they tr treated the women uh, was very low. And uh, so many practices that, uh, uh, Christianity has fought against traditionally and still uh, uh, feels, you know, that to value human life is, is important. Well, uh, so Christianity showed its value in the midst of this diversity, the moral, ethical, economic, and political challenges. So it wasn't just moral issues. It, there were economic issues and ethical issues and political challenges uh, and, and all they did, and we talked about, you know, even the persecution that the Christians had to go f through for the first uh, several hundred years. And, uh, but uh, yet Christianity grew in the midst of all that. And it started in AD 30 at Jesus' death, and by AD 350, it's estimated that approximately 60% of the 
Roman Empire was Christian, and Rodney Stark has done a great study on this in his book, The Rise of Christianity. So we need to realize that uh, we look at our situation and we might think, well, our situation is really bad and it's hard, you know, to share the Christian life and live the Christian life. Just realize that uh, our situation is probably not as bad as it was in the early church. so what the early church did gives us some direction in uh, how we should look at how we should interact in our very pluralistic uh, society, of which secularism is a growing part uh, of it. And so I think we can learn some lessons from the early church. Uh, an example of this, first of all, they were centered on Christ uh, and how much he valued humanity. He died on the cross for everyone. Uh, not just for the saved. He died for everyone so that everyone had the opportunity to uh, put their faith in him and be saved. Now, the early church, they, uh, they lived uh, their beliefs and, uh, you know, they, uh, they lived as if those beliefs made a difference in their lives and other people's lives. And they recognized Christ's attitudes and emulated them as best they could. Now, of course, Christ being perfect, uh, you know, we can't perfectly emulate him, uh, nor are we perfect in everything we do. But uh, when we can live uh, by uh, his teachings, it comes across uh, to people. And um, in one of the videos you'll watch, you'll hear uh, uh, Michael talk about uh, his first experience with missionaries when he went to uh, the country of Cyprus. And he just recognized what, what, there's something about these people that are different. And he didn't know exactly what it was, but uh, you know, it's, there are uh, uh, ways we, we live that can make a difference. And they shared uh, their beliefs within their communities um, by adhering to living in peace uh, with other people, even if it was at their own expense, uh, persecuted, yet they kept their faith and, you know, still treated people uh, with respect. Uh, They engaged in overcoming infanticide, abortions, and uh, things like that. Uh, so uh, uh, they held to a higher standard of morals and, and marital fidelity, which was not practiced. Uh, the, there was uh, nothing in Rome and, and uh, Greek uh, morality that said there had to be some kind of definition of what's right, what's wrong, and that. Uh, served the sick in times of plague, they were constantly serving people at their own risk, offered a belief system of love and hope. And uh, most people in their pluralistic society of the gods and goddesses are, uh, they engage in a, in a lot of occult stuff. There wasn't really much um, hope and certainly not love wasn't a center of what they were about. And they went so far as to start schools, even for the common people, for girls and boys. And uh, this was not available uh, early on. But we could go on and on. But hopefully in the readings you've done uh, for this course, the, you've gotten a really good grasp of uh, the impact Christianity had uh, as it grew. Uh, so the foundations of Christian living and engagement. Uh, there's some foundational things that we, that I think we just have to include to say, this is the foundation of what it means to be Christian and what's needed to engage the world around us in whether it's secular, pluralistic, or both, um, whatever that may be. First, everyone is created in the image of God. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, all people are of equal value in God's sight. And uh, God loves all people. And that's proven by Christ, by God coming in the flesh in Christ and Christ dying on the cross for all people. And so that's foundational to what we believe as Christians, but it's also part of our worldview. 
when we think about you know our uh, principles and our uh, uh, way of understanding the world, well, we see the world made up of people that are of equal value and they are loved by God. And so that's part of our presuppositions of the world we live in. We follow Jesus' two greatest commandments when he says he sums up the law and the prophets by these two commandments, the love of God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. So there's love of God, love of neighbor, love of yourself. All of these, uh, you know, these are, make up the spiritual dimension. Uh, and this is what the world needs to experience Christ's love and concern uh, for others. So you have the two greatest commandments. And then you also have the golden rule that Jesus puts forward, uh, as says in Luke 6, 31. And as you wish that others do to you, do so to them. Uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, as, it, as the saying goes. And this is a, a very important uh, aspect of that foundation that makes up uh, who we are uh, as Christians, our worldview on that. Now, I have here, down below here is a link to a video. That video is on uh, Canvas uh, under this section, uh, under this presentation. And uh, you are to, to watch it and take notes on it, just like this one. Uh, and uh, there will be one other as well. So uh, keep that in mind because uh, he's going to uh, talk about, uh, this is uh, uh, Michael here, who uh, is going to talk about engaging the secular world. Uh, on, so it's on the same topic we're talking about here, but he'll give you a good perspective. He's very articulate and uh, has a lot of good things uh, to say. And another foundational is the weightier matters of the law in Matthew 23, 23. Uh, he says there, woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you could tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others like giving a tithe. And uh, so he was pointing out to these Jewish leaders that they were missing the most important aspects of the law, weightier matters of the law, he says. And they were mercy, justice, and faithfulness here. So justice has to do with acting on behalf of others for, for a right judgment. In other words, you want what is right for people, not what is wrong for them. And uh, Christians, uh, you know, we don't want to see injustice being done to people. We want to see people treated fairly and rightly. And of course, we want a justice system that does that and follows through on that and so forth. And as Christians, we treat people justly, uh, and at least we should. And uh, we act on the behalf of benefit of others. Mercy, to show kindness, concern, and love that responds to human need and in an unexpected or unmerited way. In other words, we're not going to be merciful to people just because we think we're going to get something back. And you saw in Roman times, it was very prevalent that, you know, you're going to help somebody out. It was expected something in return. And that that's Christianity. It's we don't expect anything in return. We shouldn't expect anything in return. Now, faithfulness, being loyal, full of faith or trust, firmly and resolutely staying with a person, group, cause, belief, or idea without waiver, despite the circumstances. And this course is talking about faithfulness in the sense of being faithful to God, to Christ, and to uh, being a, a follower who puts their trust in uh, Jesus and what he's taught and so forth. And so <clears throat> these are foundation, uh, the foundation of Christian living, and the foundation for a good Christian engagement with the world around us. Because people want people like this. They want people to act towards them in the ways that are described here. And uh, they respond positively to it if we will act this way, as they did in the first century. And the same thing will happen uh, here in our time period. 
if we practice these things. And we need to practice them outside the confines of just in our churches. And not the fortress mentality, but the, you know, going out into the world, into the different communities and making a difference. So uh, I kind of show this with a pyramid uh, type of understanding. Um, the, the foundational aspect, the weightier matters of law, mercy, justice, faithfulness, golden rule, do unto others, you have them do to you. Two greatest commandments, to love the God, love your neighbor, and created in the image of God. And uh, so those are foundation to what you see here, live in Christ, love for people, serve people, and share Christ. Uh, and so uh, you have these scriptures here that we've just uh, made reference to. Uh, so telling us about these aspects, of course, uh, with share Christ Jesus' words before he sends in heaven, his, his disciples are going into all, all the world, every ethnic group. And, uh, and so that requires us getting out into all the communities of the world uh, and uh, so this to me kind of is my way of summarizing uh, this and you will want to know these things uh, for uh, your exam and I'll talk more about that as we uh, go along. All right, so you can take these and there's four keys, uh, I call them to engaging the secular world. And so these are your four keys, live in Christ, love for people, serve people, and share Christ. So that foundational stuff, you do want to know those, those foundational aspects, you know, people created in the image of God, you know, and uh, weigh your matters of the law, the two greatest commandments, all of those foundational for these four keys. So live in Christ, we represent Christ's attitude, love for people, practice sacrificial love, serve people, treat them as people created in God's image and share Christ through spiritual and physical service. You can see also, I have a link here, but uh, you won't be able to link to it through the video, uh, through this presentation, but it is one of the videos that you are required to watch for this uh, uh, section. And so you have this video I'm recording for you, and then you'll have the one uh, uh, by Michael and this one by Oz Guinness. And uh, those will make up uh, your videos uh, for this uh, week of uh, lectures. So keep that in mind uh, as you go forward. All right, uh, well, let's talk about the first uh, key here, live in Christ, represent Christ's attitude. And uh, we're just going to look at um, Bible verses that help us to see this as part of uh, biblical teaching to help us understand, uh, you know, our perspective uh, and some of the teaching revolving around how do we live in Christ? How do we represent Christ's attitude? And uh, there's many, many things that can be said here. I've just picked out some that I think are uh, good verses for us to think about, to think about how do we live in Christ? How do we represent Christ's attitude better? And so uh, we'll take a look at uh, these. Uh, first one comes from Matthew 7. This is from uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and he says to live your life built on the rock. Of course, Christ is the rock. Uh, but uh, and this comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters, and right at the end, he gives this illustration. And uh, it's kind of to summarize all this teaching he's done. You know, build your life on these teachings that he's given. And, uh, you know, you're going to be, this is the wise man. And uh, so this verse uh, here, um, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So people recognized his authority and uh, what he was saying. Who knows this, the first of it, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them is compared to the wise builder. So we need to listen to God's word and act on them. Doesn't do us any good just to listen and not do anything with them. We have to act on them. And so this is part of living our lives. We need to build our lives on Christ and we'll be like the house that's built on a rock that just doesn't, doesn't fall. Uh, some of you may have had this uh, song in Sunday school, wise men build his house on a rock, foolish men, you know. Yeah, but the key here is that at the end of his sermon, he's saying, I've given you his teachings. Now, how do you implement them? How do you act upon them? That's the important part. So, uh, so that one uh, is, is key uh, to how we live in Christ, be these wise builders. Uh, you have Romans 12 and 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live in peace with all people. Uh, part of Paul's teaching and when he says as Christians, this is what we should do. Second Corinthians 5.15, Paul points out Christ died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again on their behalf. So Paul just summarizes here that, you know, who do we live for? The one who died and rose again. And we don't live for ourselves, uh, but for we do uh, live for others as Christ lived for others. Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Whenever I read this uh, that song from this verse comes to my mind, but uh, the point is, Paul is saying by putting his faith into Christ, he, he's crucified his old self uh, of not following Christ, following Christ. And he says, it's not me who's living, uh, who lives, but Christ is working in me. And uh, so I can live, no longer live in the flesh, but live by faith in the Son of God, Christ, and the one who, who gave his life for me. So a uh, very strong passage. Um, another uh, is live by the spirit. And Paul goes on to talk about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. A wonderful passage in which uh, he says, if you're gonna live by the spirit, this, this is the things that should show up in your life. And he'll do the opposite. Here's what happens when you live by the flesh. Uh, but for us, as part of the uh, keys, four keys to engaging the second world, living in Christ means we live by the Spirit who works in Christians, Holy Spirit that works in us. And he, he helps us build the fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Does anybody not like that uh, when you act that way towards them? Uh, then 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body, talking about Christ on the cross, uh, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds we were healed. You know, we die uh, to sin, that sin, living a sinful life is not what we're about. Now, it doesn't mean we don't sin, we do, uh, and, you know, but we, we strive to live according to God's will. Uh, and we want to live for what's right, what God says is right. Our worldview is its open worldview, and God's given us direction, and we try to live that as a Christian open worldview. So live in Christ is this one here. Oops. Um, so, all right, let me get sure, make sure I'm getting to the right place here. Um, oops. Next, uh, the key is God's love uh, manifested in Christian love. So that goes back to uh, the pyramid there uh, for, uh, you know, where, where to love. Uh, 
and this this is one of the big themes throughout uh, the Bible and uh, in to, in New Testament. Um, God's love is manifested in our Christian love and the type of love we should have as followers of Christ. Uh, the Bible says God is love, and so you know if you want to summarize. Uh, the attitude that is overwhelmingly manifest who God is, it is God is love. He, uh, he loves his creation and he does everything he can to, uh, through the cre creation's free will, to draw them back into a relationship with him. And, you know, you have the passage, we'll look at this a little bit later, some more. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, so he gives him to be in a sacrifice on the cross uh, so that people can come back in a right relationship. It's God manifesting his love to us in, a, in the deepest way that can be done for humans is that we know somebody really cares for us. They're willing to sacrifice their life for us. And uh, God uses that in history of coming in the flesh and dying on the cross. Um, you have the ability rebellious son parable which is the parable of the lost sheep the lost coin then the parable of the lost son and the son leaves his father takes his inheritance and squatters the whole thing and with his and then you know thinks well uh, his servants of his father were better off than he is now being poor no money and have to eat what the pigs are eating and uh, so he goes back but the father's waiting for him watching for him and he comes back and he puts on the robe, steps him back as his son. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, parable of God's love for his uh, creation and uh, for people he created in his image. Uh, you have in John 17, 26, uh, uh, John records, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Now this comes, John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, and it's the longest recorded prayer we have of Jesus. Uh, and, uh, but in this part of it, he points out that, you know, he's made the message that God sent him to, to share with uh, his followers. And, uh, but he's also praying that the love that God had uh, for him may be in them. It's godly love, this uh, love we'll talk about down below here, agape love. Uh, and so it talks about we share in having the same type of love that God has for us. And uh, we share that same kind of love with other people. You have the four words for love in Greek. Uh, probably heard sermons or people teaching on it. Uh, storge, empathy, the empathy bond type of love. It's not as strong as the last one down there, agape, uh, but uh, it does show a, a kindness and care for people. Philea is a more of a friendship bond uh, and uh, like uh, Philadelphia's meaning uh, has that idea of a, a friendship. Uh, eros, uh, although it does not actually appear in the New Testament, it was in uh, the Greek language. It's more romantic or sexual love. Uh, it's more in line with the physical side of things. Uh, but the one that's uh, the term that's used uh, in New Testament most frequently is agape, which is unconditional love. Same word is used for God's love for us. Uh, and it's the same word that God says uh, the type of love we should have for one another and for other people, all people, and so forth. So this whole idea of love is a big thing uh, throughout the Bible, and especially in, in the New Testament, which is where we'll be concentrating on that. And so um, uh, I picked uh, some verses out of many verses that are available, uh, and we will talk about this uh, second key. Uh, to engage the second world, you know, love for people. And uh, then uh, we'll, at the end of this part, we'll cut this off, this presentation off, and we'll pick up with uh, um, the, the next one, uh, serving people. 
after that in the next week's lectures. So this is part one of uh, living, uh, uh, engaging the secular and pluralistic world. So let's, we'll finish up here with uh, love for people, practicing this sacrificial love. Now, granted, it's challenging and uh, it's really hard sometimes when people can be un so, so unloving and, uh, you know, so uh, violent at times. And we look around and see all of so many terrible things that can go on long, go on in the world. And, uh, you know, and some people act so unlovingly to, towards other people and abuse them and take advantage of them and traffic them uh, to, for their own gains. And uh, there's all kinds of things. And of course, Christians should be opposed to that just like they were in the early church. Uh, of course, the, the uh, big scripture that uh, is used uh, here and you know, used to be the most memorized scripture uh, out there, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, uh, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And a lot of people know that verse, you know, he gave his only son, and so people can believe in him so they could have eternal life. But some don't think about the second part, uh, seven, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, in other words, condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God's love for the whole world is seen in sending Jesus into the world and Jesus uh, sharing God's message and dying on the cross to get that message across that that's how much God cares for them. And it's not, he didn't come to condemn the world, he came to save the world. And we should carry the same mindset. You know, we're not here to condemn the world, we're here to share the message of Jesus uh, so people can uh, put their faith in him and be saved. So um, that's a foundational uh, scripture on love. Another one that is a hard teaching of Jesus is uh, in Matthew 5. Uh, this is coming from the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at the end of it where he talked about being the wise man who hears God's words and acts upon them. Well, part of what he's taught in there is on love. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, so he's saying, you know, the common view is, you know, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. He's saying, no, nah, I say, love your enemies and even pray for the ones that persecute you. Now, that's getting really, really tough. And now early Christians, this would have meant a lot more to them because they were being persecuted. We, we don't tend to have that much persecution, but yet. We, we can get hateful attitudes towards us or things like that, or somebody takes a disliking to us. So they can, we do have people that we might look at, they don't like me or they're my enemy uh, and we should pray for them. Uh, and he says, so that you may be sons of your father. In other words, like Jesus uh, in that. Uh, and remember that he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. God gives is does that he he is the god who loves both evil and good people he wants all of them to be in a right relationship with him and uh so uh we have to view people of that valuable as well uh to show that love for them and that's tough uh, it's a, that's a tough teaching and one that we really have to work on so uh some other verses here um john 3 13 35 they will know you're my disciples by your love for each other. So we have to love for each other. And we, we manifest this. We exemplify this in our own attitudes towards one another as followers of Christ. Uh, but we also practice it towards other people. Uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Uh, our love of God has to be manifested in how we live our lives, following God's guidance. Uh, John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this that he laid down his life for another. Now this is coming up towards the time when Jesus is gonna be crucified and 
uh, you know, he's going to lay down his life. And so uh, he's saying a, saying a principle here, um, you know, greater love can't be shown than somebody that gives their life for somebody else. And that's what Jesus did on the cross and gave a spiritual life and improved our physical life as well. And, uh, you know, but we too have to live sacrificially and love people like Jesus did. Uh, John 15, 17, he just commands this, commanded to love one another. And then Paul talks in 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, abound in love for all people. Uh, so that's uh, Paul's advice to Christians he was writing in Thessalonica. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Paul writes, let it all you do be done in love. You should have a loving attitude in everything you do. And then Ephesians 4, 2, and also in verse 15, love with humility and speak truth in love. I find sometimes people want to speak the truth, but they don't do it in a loving manner. We should always do it in a loving manner and a humble manner, uh, not with pride and arrogance, uh, being better than others. We're not. We are all created in image of God and of equal value. And then, uh, of course, one of the greatest uh, passages on love is 1 Corinthians 13. Paul writes uh, this passage. And it's a good one for us to end on for this uh, section and just read through it and note uh, what love does. Uh, you know, uh, my wife actually had a, a, uh, a teacher at the university we were uh, graduating from. Uh, she asked him if he would put this passage to music and he did and it was sung at our wedding. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a wonderful passage on love uh, and is known as the love chapter. And so uh, let's take a look at that as we end this section. Uh, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I sur surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. And it's not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but when then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. And here's how he ends it. But now faith, hope, love abide these three but the greatest of these faith hope love is love so love is one of those uh, aspects uh, that have to be a part of who we are as christians our worldview and it has to come out of our worldview that they have this attitude of love and that's going to take us into the next one where we're going to talk about the third key, serve people. But we'll be starting on that uh, in the next lecture. So I'll say goodbye from this lecture and see you in the next one. And take care and have a good day.